Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. Infamous pirate John Hawkins was one of the many buccaneers that roamed the shores of North America on behalf of Queen Elizabeth I. Born in Plymouth, England in 1532, Admiral Sir John Hawkins was an Elizabethan shipbuilder, naval administrator and commander, merchant, navigator, privateer, and slave trader. One of the foremost seamen of 16th century England, he was the chief architect of the Elizabethan Navy. He devised a naval blockade to intercept Spanish treasure ships in the Caribbean. For this, he was considered a pirate by the Spanish, but a privateer by the Queen of England. Hawkins and his crew were some of the first travelers from Europe to observe tobacco use in the Americas during their voyages. A chronicle of his 1565 voyage recounts the French Huguenot inhabitants of Fort Caroline smoking tobacco leaves. He and his men brought back both the leaves and the practice of smoking to England. War in France precluded a resupply mission to Fort Caroline and the colony struggled. Eric Yanis of the Other States of America podcast has graciously agreed to share his telling of this incredible story. What's going on at Fort Caroline? In September 1564, the second wave of colonists arrived from France. They come with supplies, they brought women and children, they also brought criminals. Sometimes they couldn't get bodies to go on these risky endeavors, and they'd actually have to recruit from the prisons. And just to fill out their crew even more, on the way over, the French ships actually endeavored into some pirating, and the people they captured on those ships were now part of French Florida. With them was the first reform minister, or the first minister period, in the colony, and services would be held daily. Beside the pious Huguenots who make up Fort Caroline, there's all these other people now. And right from the get-go, these people coming over from France, willingly or not, and the native women start to have relations with one another. Nature abhors a vacuum, and people want nothing more than to fill that vacuum. In the same month of September, 1564, French pirates visit Fort Caroline, no doubt from their escapades down in the Caribbean against Spanish possessions and Spanish ships. And while they were a welcome surprise to the fort, they planted a seed that would cause the bleeding of Fort Caroline. The discontented masses of men who wanted gold and silver. After the French pirates came and they left, Many of these men realized, hey, let's not wait to go west and split up the money with everybody else. Let's steal some boats, and then we can go pirating all our own in places that have already been mapped out for us. The Spanish New World. And so before very long, 11 sailors came together, stole a ship, left Fort Caroline. Another incident, two carpenters stole a ship, left to do the same kind of dirty business. So now the men had to start building ships. But this was one more duty that ate up the time of the people at Fort Caroline that could have been spent growing or finding, trading for, fishing, hunting, food, getting food. The natives took notice of their lack of food and ability to obtain food. And so the cost of obtaining food from them went higher and higher. The natives understood economics well. This is again another common misconception that Native Americans were somehow ignorant of value. They weren't. They saw that the French desperately needed food, and so the price of food went through the roof. As the French had eaten up their initial gifts from the making of alliances and the, the greeting of one another, and began trading away everything just to obtain food. But if it weren't for the natives, they would have all starved to death. As for provisions, which it had been hoped would be abundant in this new world, none at all were found. And unless the natives had furnished us from their own stores from day to day, some of us must assuredly have perished from starvation especially such as we did not know how to use firearms in hunting. Now, we always assume that men in the past knew how to hunt. Well, owning a gun doesn't mean you know how to hunt, especially when it came to European men who may have lived in cities and then joined the army and were trained on how to use guns. Well, they often learned how to shoot in a volley with a group of other people. In this case, they just had to know how to shoot at the same time or relatively at the same time as the other people in their group and in the same general direction. This would create a deadly wall of lead. But hunting is a precision sport, and one missed shot is enough noise to scare away everything you wanted to eat. The hunger began to set in, and rations were laid out, tempers flared. And in December of 1564, a nobleman led 66 mutineers. 
At midnight, the chief of the conspirators, armed with a sword, carrying his gun in hand, and having twenty gunmen along with him, seized the keys of the armory in the storehouse. These rebels demanded papers, allowing them, on behalf of the French crown, to privateer in the Caribbean. And then the mutineers took their one ship. The ship just built, they took it. The fledgling colony was now without a ship. They were down 66 men. Oh, things have taken a dark turn. For this part, we turn to the French who write of these rebels. They set sail from Carolina on the 8th of December, calling us cowards and green hands, and threatening that if on their return from New Spain, with the wealth they propose to acquire, we shall refuse to admit them into the fort, they would tread us underfoot. The 66 mutineers eventually found their way to the Caribbean, and they stole several ships, broke up into several small parties. But at the end of the day, the Spanish got the better of them. The authorities caught up to them eventually, and many were executed, many were imprisoned, many were made to do forced labor, and basically all of them were snitching, were squealing, were saying, oh yeah, we came from this fort. It's in what you call Spanish Florida. So now the Spanish authorities were certain of the existence of a French fort. Fort Caroline has been outed, and from the Spanish perspective, it was a den of pirates. And of these 66, a small few managed to limp back to Fort Caroline after being gone for many months, after being initially successful pirates, and then having to flee for their lives from the Spanish. The men at Fort Caroline working along the riverbanks welcomed them back, brought them into the fort, and then, depending on the account, either killed some of them or every single one of them. Let's return to the main story of Fort Caroline. We're now moving up to January of the year 1565. And again, we return to the major problem occurring at the colony. Nobody brought over farmers. Nobody planted food. And now we're reaching the time of year where the Tamuka would take up seasonal hunting and they would go off to hunting camps. They would seemingly disappear into the woods from the European perspective. And now even the few natives who were still trading with the Europeans all but disappeared. There was no way to get food now, and their hunting season would last typically the rest of winter. And so you're talking April, maybe late March, before you're really going to see the Tamukan chiefdoms come back together. And so the rations are running out. All the same pressures that existed before are still there. The only relief valve is that people mutiny sometimes and they leave, and then there's less people to feed, and there's less anger overall. But the problems resurge, moving into February of 1565. Another group of mutineers steal some ships, and they leave. They go off to the Caribbean. Same deal. They capture a ship with some very important Spanish officials, New World Spanish officials. They end up killing a Spanish judge. And when, of course, this group was captured, it is recorded in the Spanish sources that they told the Spanish exactly where the River of May was, which is what they call the St. John's, which is exactly the river that Fort Caroline was on. And so entering into March of 1565, we see more mutineers coming back, more mutineers being executed, morale at Fort Caroline at an all-time low. Now, put yourselves in the shoes of a young colonist at Fort Caroline. You're not finding any gold of the west of you, no silver, you're not making any progress with the native chiefdom. In fact, you can't even really communicate with any of them at this point. They're off hunting. And if you mutiny, well, as you've seen, you're going to get caught by the Spanish. If you manage to limp back, well, then the French are going to kill you. There's been no communication from home, no resupply. The feeling of helplessness, the feeling of being trapped, must have been overwhelming. Only to be overtaken by just the raw gut hunger that you must have at this point. And as winter slowly fades away, the southeast of the North American coast gets awfully hot, awfully humid. And so while we heard about all these descriptions of this new place, French Florida, how beautiful when they landed the clear water and all the things growing on all the trees and the friendly natives, suddenly here we are less than a year later and everything is the same and yet different. They're seeing the other side of what they thought was going to be paradise. Colonists were reduced to foraging in the woods among plants they had no familiarity with just eating things at random, seeing if it would kill them or not and hunting alligators with sticks. Now we're coming up on the spring, and Chief Utina is back, or Utina, the Tamukan chief. Help should be coming from this guy. And Utina provides some food, less and less over time, and by spring of 1565, Utina says to the French, I have no more food for you, but I have villages that are in rebellion against me. One village in particular is full of food. You invade that village for me, 
retake command of it, hand it over to me, and you'll get all their food. The French, out of desperation, say, yes, great idea. They raise their forces, they pick up their guns, they organize themselves, and they successfully massacre this village for Utina, the Tamukin chief, only to find that this village had no food stores. They themselves were starving. They had been tricked by Utina into taking over this territory on his behalf with no reward. Utina gave them a, a small, piddly amount of food as compensation and sent the French away. Incensed by this and starving on rations since at least December, men seized Otina. And as a hostage of the French, he was marched to all of his subordinate villages. The French demanded food in return for their chief. Ah, but the natives were up to something. They negotiated with the French and they said, okay, well, we all have different food stores and you're all over the place. How about you go back to the chief's village and you wait there and we'll come and bring you food to the one location. And this way, we'll be present and we'll know our chief is safe because we'll see him being released. The French, out of pure desperation, having no time to really think this through, agree to it. And slowly, the natives start showing up with corn. Piles and piles of corn. Natives are coming from 30 different villages, creating a gigantic heap for the French soldiers. And while Utina is being held hostage, Satira shows up, his enemy. And Satira offers a load of food himself saying, if you hand over Utina to me, you can have all of this. The French refuse, but what ultimately amounted to maybe two dozen Frenchmen with guns were getting more and more nervous. You see, in Utina's village, natives from many other villages were gathering. Not only were they bringing corn, but they were just hanging around. And now 24 Frenchmen, even with guns, were beginning to become quite, quite frightened of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of young native braves. The native plan was to provide so much food to the French that the French would have a hard time carrying it. They would be overburdened. And a man carrying 150 pounds of corn is pretty easy to attack, especially when you have overwhelming numerical superiority. And so when the French were satisfied, they loaded themselves up on corn, each one carrying as much as they possibly could because they were starving and they wanted to return as heroes and provide for their loved ones and their friends. As they're marching down the trail, the natives descend with a volley of arrows, and then they rush them. The French, in a panic, throw down the food and run in all sorts of directions. They scatter. The fighting goes on for hours between individuals. All in all, 22 of the Frenchmen are injured, two are killed, and nobody got any food. The relationship with Satira's people ruined, Utina's people ruined. The French no longer cared for diplomacy. Back at Fort Caroline, with nothing left to eat, the French sent out organized detachments of men to raid native villages and just outright take their food. No negotiations, no trades. The French at this point has gloves off, but perhaps fortunate to everyone in French Florida at the time. The French, dwindled by mutinies and starving to death, grew to be a very weak force. Right about the beginning of summer of 1565, it seems that Fort Caroline was entering a death spiral. There are reports of colonists eating the fetuses of pregnant dogs and also hunting alligators and snakes to eat. The French report that people even resorted to grinding up the bones of dead, picked over carcasses to try to make some sort of bread out of it. Some of us had actually perished of hunger and all the rest were starved until our skin cleaved to our bones. We gave up hope of receiving reinforcements from France. But just as hope was lost, a ship was spotted on the horizon out at the mouth of the river, off the coast. If it would be a French flag, that'd be good news. Their salvation. If it would be a Spanish flag, it could mean the end of everyone. This time they notice it happens to be an English flag. It ended up being a merchant, soon to be pirate, by the name of John Hawkins, a man who many credit with introducing both tobacco and slavery to the English. To the French at this time, he was a welcome sight. What Hawkins saw was horrifying. He gave the French as much food as he could. He noticed that the French had finally relented and was building vessels to get everyone, the whole colony, back to France. But the vessels looked terrible. Hawkins didn't want to see the French people try to make their way back over across the ocean in these rickety little things. The French didn't want to accept any more gifts from him. He had fed people, saved the lives of people, and so in return for one of Hawkins' ships, the French gave them a large number of guns and cannon, which the colony would not need anymore because the whole thing would be dissolving. Now, there are some who believe that the Spanish actually sent John Hawkins there to tempt the French into abandoning their colony. 
And if they did, it seems to have worked. The St. John's River is the longest river in Florida, flowing 310 miles north from its headwaters at Blue Cypress Lake in Indian River County to its mouth where it empties into the Atlantic Ocean east of Jacksonville, near where French Huguenot Fort Caroline stood. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. <laughs>